So here's a pH scale ranging from a 3 pH to a 10.5 pH. Uh, and here you can see it's exponential, uh, where we're going from a 7 to 8, that's 10 times more alkaline, or even up to a 10.5, which is 5,000 times more alkaline, versus, let's say, from a 7 to a 3 pH, which is 10,000 times more acidic. And what that means is, is the body becomes more acidic. It means it contains a higher concentration of positive charges or hydrogen ions. If the water is becoming more alkaline, then it contains more electrical negative charges or electrons in the water, so the water is, a saturate, uh, uh, is saturated with electrical energy in the form of electrons. As I've tested many different substances, uh, like orange juice, for example, uh, I have found that the pH of orange juice is highly acidic. Uh, here we have a, uh, a product, Sunny Delight, with a pH of 2.81, with an electrical charge which is saturated with hydrogen ions, which is then expressed in a positive charge at 232, milli uh, 232 millivolts. Uh, Bud Light uh, has a pH of 4.25, which is also acidic and also carries an electrical charge which is saturated with hydrogen iron, uh, ions giving an electrical uh, reading in millivolts of 177 millivolts. Uh, coffee at 5 with positive 140 millivolts. So when we look at some of the most common fluids that people are drinking we find out that they're moderately or highly acidic and they carry a charge that would pull energy from the body rather than contribute energy to the body. Now this is an important thing to understand because as we're putting alkalinity in our body, this is actually contributing to our alkaline bank account or our alkaline reserves. When we're pulling energy or alkalinity away from our bodies, this is going to deplete our alkaline bank and of course create a symptom of enervation. And the biochemistry is very, very extreme. For example, uh, one of the metabolites uh, or acids from uh, metabolism is carbonic acid or H2CO3. Well carbonic acid is highly acidic and it takes 20 parts of sodium bicarbonate which is what the stomach produces in order to neutralize this me metabolite from metabolism. It takes 20 parts of sodium bicarbonate to neutralize one part of carbonic acid in order to maintain a normal pH of 7.365. So the body is constantly in need of alkalinity. The body is constantly starving for more electrons. It takes it from our food, it takes it from the water we drink, it can even take it from the sun. We absorb it through the skin. So many ways to get electrons uh, into our body, but this is what our body feeds on. You see, our bodies are electrical. They run on electricity not on calories, not on sugar, not on proteins, not on carbohydrates, not on fats, but it runs on the electrical potential of what we're drinking, what we're eating, and what we're absorbing. Okay, So it's very, very important to understand that it's just about impossible to overalkalize because the ratios are quite extreme in the biochemistry of our bodies. This is a picture of, of blood from one of my clients that I, that I took many years ago who was on a highly acidic diet incorporating lots of sugar and animal proteins. You'll notice that the blood is irregularly shaped and of course in the plasma you see uh, uh, entities there that look like ping pong balls. These are what are referred to as Y-form yeast, a lot like uh, candida albicans. In the right side you see the healthy organization, unhealthy organization of the way the blood coagulates. Uh, I'll show you here in a minute what healthy blood looks like when it coagulates, but it should not have any of these white areas at all. The actual clot should be tight, should be held together with a protein called fibrin, and there should be no spaces or missing uh, red blood cell conglomerate. Uh, here we see in the center we see round symmetrical round protein pools which indicates an, inflation, an irritation or an inflammation 
of the base of the body, which would be your, your reproductive organs or your bowels. Where here in an AIDS patient who had been on uh, AZT and other uh, chemical drugs for over 10 years, we see uh, a, a clot that is, is hypocoagulated, uh, coagulated, which is common in a degenerative condition where there's lots of red blood cell conglomerate missing. Here is the uh, healthy state of the red blood cells when you're on an alkalizing lifestyle and diet, particularly when you're hydrating with electron-rich alkaline water. The red blood cells are round and symmetrical, even in color, even in shape, even in size. The plasma is clear or clean. There's not a lot of cellular debris. And when we look at the way the blood coagulates, there's no missing red blood cell conglomerate where there's just white pasty masses. It's just one mat of red held together with a protein called fibrin, tightly held together in a hypercoagulated state. This is the state of those who are experiencing the highest level of energy, vitality, health, and fitness. This kind of blood you don't get. This kind of blood you have to work out. Just like when you work out to build muscle, you have to work out with intention to build healthy blood, you know, in order to build healthy bones and muscles. You do it with what you eat, and you do it especially with what you drink. You probably noticed down in the corner, there's a fishbowl. And I hadn't referred to this as, as yet, but it's a metaphor that I've used for many, many years. And it starts out like this. When the fish is sick, what would you do? Would you treat the fish or change the water? And as you think about that question, the, amp the answer intuitively is very simple. Well, you would not treat the fish, but you would change the water. The next question is, what would your doctor do? Or how do we, how do we actually look at sickness and disease, and how do we respond to it? We respond to the treatment of the organs that are sick, rather than realizing that the organ or gland or tissue that is sick or diseased is only as healthy as the water it swims in, much like the fish. The fish is only as healthy as the water uh, it swims in. So if overacidification is bad, then how does our body take care of this problem? Well, you have four channels of elimination to get rid of acid. You've got respiration. What would happen if you weren't able to get rid of carbon dioxide? Well, we know we used to do this as kids. We would hold our breath and see how long it took before we passed out. It only takes about three or four minutes. Then you lay there unconscious until the body can get rid of that particular or neutralize that particular acid and you wake up. Well, carbon dioxide is an acid that's produced during metabolism. It's a gas. You see, acids take on different forms, gas, liquid, or solid. Of course, we can't say, how do we get rid of all of our acid, because we're constantly producing it through our thoughts and our words and our deeds. So the body has uh, a system. It's not a system that you can read about in the biology books, but it's a system called the alkaline buffering system. And the alkaline buffering system starts with the stomach. The stomach is the major organ that produces the alkalinity the body needs in order to neutralize the acids it produces through metabolism. That particular uh, alkaline compound is called sodium bicarbonate. So it begins with the stomach. As the stomach produ produces sodium bicarbonate, it delivers it by the circul circulatory system, the blood, to the various glands, so the salivary glands. What does the salivary gland release? It releases a compound called sodium bicarbonate. It, it also fills up the pyloris glands, the lubricant glands, uh, the pancreas as a gland secretes sodium bicarbonate to raise the alkalinity of the food that we eat and the liquids that we drink. Well, our body becomes overwhelmed with acid from lifestyle and dietary cho uh, choices. If we smoke, uh, tobacco, if we chew tobacco, if we take pharmaceutical or recreational drugs, uh, if we're drinking acidic water, uh, if we're not exercising and removing acids through the pores of our skin, acids build up. So uh, what we eat, what we drink, and even our thoughts can create an over-acidic uh, body, overwhelming our body systems. 
and we go into what I call the alkaline buffering deficit. Now, where we're in an alkaline buffering deficit, what do we experience? We experience the seven stages of acidosis. We experience enervation, irritation, sensitivities, catarrh or mucus buildup, inflammation, induration, ulceration, and unfortunately, it's, we're seeing this more and more and more. We're seeing degeneration. This is the effect of a buffering deficit. Anyone who is sick or tired has been in a buffering deficit, an alkaline buffering deficit, for months and for years. So the buffering effect is uh, where the body starts responding to these acids. It starts neutralizing, uh, as I gave you an example earlier, uh, the body will actually take, uh, the stomach will produce the sodium bicarbonate, pull that into the blood to neutralize metabolic acids, and you end up with hydrochloric acid in the stomach, which is a waste product of sodium bicarbonate production. Do we need hydrochloric acid in the stomach? Absolutely not. You see, the stomach is not an organ of digestion. The stomach is an organ of contribution. Its main contribution is to manage the alkaline design of the human body. It's not to digest food. In fact, you only have one instrument to digest food, and that's your teeth. If you don't liquefy the food with your teeth in your mouth, then it goes into the stomach and out into the small and large intestine partially undigested. So it's very, very important. If you don't have the energy to chew, you know, then buy a blender, blend it, buy a juicer, juice it, but get it into a state that the body can utilize the energy and life force of that particular food. When we're looking at the small intestine and we realize the food has to be in a liquefied state, but on top of that, it has to be in an alkaline state. That liquid has a pH, ideally, of 8.4. So it's very, very important that we help support the alkaline design of the body and, the liquid, and keeping those fluids liquid by adding alkaline water. And so I, which is very, very strange for, for most health practitioners to actually recommend drinking alkaline water when you're eating. Because what we've been told is now in, op in opposition or actually the reverse of what we should have been told and need to understand. And that's it. that is that here again, when we drink with our meals, we neutralize the acids of the stomach as the stomach is secreting alkalinity of the food to prepare it for biological transformation in the crypts of the small intestine. It is in the crypts of the small intestine that this liquefied food at a pH at 8.4 that you've helped to support by drinking alkaline water. You can then transform this food into embryonic cells that become the erythroblast in our new blood that travels through our circulatory system to become the new body cells. It all begins in the crypts of the small intestine. This is one of the reasons why I don't recommend eating foods that do not digest. They don't break down. Well, what foods would those be? Well, that would be beef, chicken, pork, and fish. They do not completely liquefy. So if you're going to eat any of these types of foods, you need to put them in a blender and juice them. You've got to get them into a liquefied state because if chicken goes into the small intestine partially undigested, it falls into the crypts of the small intestine, ferments, rots, and destroys the root system of your body. And then what happens then is you stop producing healthy blood. And when you stop producing healthy blood, you cannot produce healthy body cells. This is probably the most important critical point that I can mention and why I recommend drinking alkaline water. It is so critically important that we keep the fluids of our body alkaline from the mouth to the stomach and especially in the small intestine.